the teaching methods that were taught in the lecture not last week a few weeks back direct method silent way and suggestopedia okay so today we are going to look at three more uh, teaching methods that can be used in the english or language learning classroom one is a total physical response um, lexical approach and grammar translation method gtm uh, ta sorry la lexical approach and tpr total physical response okay first we are going to look at uh, the gmt or the general sorry grammar is it supposed to be gtm sorry there's something there's a mistake there gtm so grammar translation method okay gtm not gmt grammar translation method before we go can anybody tell me uh, what you think gtm uh, teaches grammar okay of course because it's already that grammar anything else vocabulary focuses focuses on vocabulary translated from grammar okay sorry context clue anything else okay let's have a look at gtm actually it is very very old uh, it dated back to erasmus 1466 is in the 15th century to 1536 so uh, the method of grammar translation has been advocated since the 15th century it was a long time ago the method was being practiced but the name was not gtm it was something else uh, we didn't know what it was called but the practice the method was or was found as early as in the 15th century originally used to teach latin and greek in the late 19th century and early 20th century now latin is a language which is already dead okay uh, there's no speakers when the language is dead meaning that there's no speakers however uh, some countries some western countries they still teach their students the latin language because it's the language of the early religion so people in the united kingdom people in uh, australia still learn latin even though uh, they don't speak it so things like magni nominis umbra uh, that is latin okay all right uh, or uh, carpe diem seize the day you've heard of that motto yeah, yeah that is latin that is latin we no longer use it there's no speakers but uh, people in the uk the students or, or uh, learners in uk they learn latin uh, in as early as seven years old so they can speak it it's just that there's no other speakers in the world who can speak with them right even though latin is dead there are still people who, who learn learn latin okay okay grammar translation method the objectives of this method is reading that is the objective able to read in the target language remember when you learn about the direct method what was it for direct method what was it for communicate for speaking isn't it for speaking skills what about a silent way speaking reading okay so this is also another method which focuses on reading uh, the gtm is on reading not on grammar per se okay able to read in the target language meaning that once you have gone through the direct method which is speaking the next step is to read fluently in the target language you can speak fluently 
Now through GTM, uh, students are advocated or students are hoped to be able to read in the target language. Able to translate. Remember in the direct method, you cannot translate. Isn't it? You have to think even in the target language. Yeah. Huh? There's no other language. Um, there's no other language were allowed in the class. It's just a target language. But in this method, you are allowed to translate. Able to translate from, from one language to another. So you can translate. You can use your own mother tongue and translate it into the target language. It's allowed. Develop and improve the passive skill, we call it. The reading and the writing. Okay, so develop and improve reading and writing skills. So GTM, the objectives are threefold. One is to be able to read fluently. The second one is the students should be able to translate the language whenever they want to use it. And the third one is to develop and improve reading and writing skills. So these are the objectives of the uh, grammar translation methods. Oh, sorry, there's another one. Four is to aid in mental exercises. When you do a lot of writing and reading, there are a lot of things happening in your mind. When you do a lot of writing, for example, you have to brainstorm, like what I mentioned just now, isn't it? You have to brainstorm. Brainstorm uses mental activities. When you read, you have to understand. Understanding, making comprehension is using mental activities. So these are the things that can help when you are using the GTM. Your mental activities will be uh, done faster. The key features, able to use native language. So this is always a target of any method that we have learned. You want to learn the native language or the target language. Vocabulary and grammar rules. So in GTM, because it's grammar, so we teach the students to learn grammar rules. Meaning you have to know when to use is, when to use present perfect, when to use present continuous. Okay, these are the things that you have to know because in the direct way and silent uh, way, direct method and silent way, you don't learn the grammar rules. You listen to the teacher, isn't it? You listen to the teacher, you model. But in GTM, you need to know the vocabulary and grammar rules. It's focusing on accuracy, not fluency. Not meaning, but on the form. And you have to be accurate in translation as well. And I remember, you know, sometimes when you have time, uh, look at the subtitles in uh, English movies, for example. Sometimes you find that the translation is atrocious. Isn't it? I have seen a few translations for example, uh, there's one war movie, uh, duck, it becomes ite instead of tundo. Okay, and you know what a lollipop man is? Lollipop man, have you heard of a term lollipop man? No, okay, lollipop man is a person who is always in front of the school, holding traffic. Ah, yes, the one with the lollipop. Okay, it's uh, usually a man or a lady. Okay, so in, in UK, they call it the lollipop lady or the lollipop man. So I saw one movie, uh, the, the lady was um, sending his dot, her daughter to school and then the, uh, the daughter said, okay, it's okay, you don't have to send me off because the, the lollipop lady can uh, take me uh, across the road. And the translation goes, Nanti penjual lollipop itu akan membawa saya melintasi jalan. Content wise is wrong. Because it's not about the lollipop selling person. It's about the person who holds the traffic. So these are the things that sometimes translation can be very, very critical. Okay, you translate. Uh, I bought a sheep yesterday. 
And the translation goes Saya membeli kambing Instead of saya beli kapal Okay so these are the things that uh, You need to know And grammar translation method Wants it to be accurate It's very difficult isn't it Because the, of the contact Same like uh, duck D-U-C-K D-U-C-K when a bomb comes It doesn't mean it take It means tunduk Isn't it So these are the things If you want to be translators Be very very careful that you are accurate Okay And then uh, Also language skills uh, I think this is Very important in any of the methods Because you, uh, you have to be very fluent In the language skills as well Okay So it's not exclusive to GTM It's, as, it's, it's all the methods Advocated by all the methods Okay Remember I asked you what this deductive and inductive means? Okay, so grammar translation method uses the deductive way of learning Meaning that the grammars are taught exclusively Inductive meaning the grammar is taught inside the content Deductive means you are taught grammar rules exclusively Okay, meaning that you have to go through a grammar class Uh, is was wo, uh, is are uh, was were okay how do you use is when do you use was okay those those kind of things okay focuses on grammar rules that's why uh, people who will learn through this method will write brilliantly because you know the rules when do you use what okay So grammar rules are focused on Grammar is presented along with the rules So one, uh, you, you teach the item And then the rules are also taught in the, uh, the, the At the same time when the item was introduced For example, when do you use present tense? What are the rules of using present tense? Apart from when it is present Habitual, yes Somebody has done some reading Habitual facts, yes I brush my teeth every day That is habitual She wakes up 7 o'clock every morning That's habitual One is habitual Present is whatever things happen in the present Is using present tense Okay, the other thing is Facts Thank you Like the sun rises in the east The earth moves around the sun The moon moves around the earth So these are facts So you have to use present tense Not just for present conditions The other one is sometimes you can use it for future tense Okay He leaves home tomorrow at 9 You can also say he is leaving home tomorrow at 9 But that's not, it's not wrong to say he leaves home tomorrow at 9 So that is also used for future So these are the rules that is being presented When you learn one grammar item And teachers have to know that It's not just for present tense For example, perfect tenses What are they for? There are several uh, several uh, situations Where perfect sentences are used Perfect tenses are used Okay, So, the grammar is presented Along with the rules Students learn better They can understand better And they will remember better Because, oh, if it's fact Then it's always going to be Present tense If it's habitual action It's going to be present tense Okay Apply rules to examples given So there will be a lot of examples And a lot of samples <coughs> For the students to practice on Because remember this is Writing and reading So they have to do a lot of writing To make sure that the grammar rules are Ingested and internalized Reading comprehension The answer will be in target language So sometimes The comprehension questions are given in 
the native language, mother tongue. That's when you have to translate and use the target language to answer the questions. Okay, so your your reading passage will be in your own language, be it in Mandarin or Bahasa Malaysia or Tamil. But when the comprehension comes in, you have to answer them in English. So that's where the translation comes in. Which one is easier? Answer in your own language or answer in the target language? Own language. You read in the target language, you answer in your own language. It's easier than you read in the own language and answer in the target language, isn't it? It's easier. But both involves translation. And again, you need to be very, very careful with the translation. Because there is no grammar, sorry, there are no tenses in Bahasa Malaysia. What about in uh, Mandarin? No tenses in Mandarin. What about in Tamil? Is there any tenses in Tamil? No tenses in Tamil. Okay. So that will pose a problem when you are translating. Isn't it? We use words like, uh, for example, in Bahasa, we use words like semalam, kemarin, to show past. But in English, you have the tenses, the regular tenses, irregular verbs, so on and so forth. In French, it's even worse. You've got uh, male and female, masculine and feminine. Yes, as well as the Arabic, la and la. Which one is la? Which one is la? So, you know, when it comes into translation, that will pose a problem. Okay? How do you categorize the feminine objects in English? There's no, uh, in English, there's no feminine or masculine object. All objects are the same. But in French and Arabic, there are categories uh, like that. Reading-wise, for example, and then uh, in in um, in Mandarin, one word can mean a lot of things, right? Ma can mean so many things, right? So you no, know, these are the things that is also will pose problem to uh, G GTM because you are using translation. Okay, teachers' roles. Teacher will be the authority figure, so teacher will control the class. Teacher will have a full control of the class and there will be more teacher talking time. So it's not going to be student-centered because uh, when you do a lot of translations, teachers have to make sure that you translate correctly. Uh, then, you know, there'll be no dodo or ma instead of for mum. You, they, they say it's for a horse, isn't it? Ma is also for horse, right? So, you know, things like that. So, we have to be very careful. So, that means a teacher has to be the authority figure. Important for correct answers to be given. It's very important. If I give a sentence, uh, yesterday I, I was, uh, somebody posted on my Facebook, uh, this uh, English can be very confusing. I will try and post it on Moodle. Uh, something like um, we have to uh, take the refuse out. Uh, no, uh, it's time to polish the Polish. Wow. You have heard of that verb? It's time to polish the Polish. The soldier deserts his post in the desert to eat some dessert. I will post that in Moodle and then you can see how confusing. Uh, if vegetarians eat vegetables, then humanitarians eat what? Humans? Okay, and then punctuation wise, I will try to post them on Moodle and have a look. You can have a look at it. Uh, it's very, very confusing. That is going to be very confusing when you do translation. How do you polish a pol Polish? The, 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 the sound is different, but the spelling is the same. Record and record. Present, present. Uh, it's going to be very difficult when you translate. I'm going to uh, present you a present. And the translation will be, saya akan hadiahkan kamu hadiah. Okay, still okay, but 
What if it's other types of words which has got similar uh, spelling and different meaning? So it's going to be very difficult. Okay? Teacher needs to provide correct answers if wrong answers given by students. So if you remember some of the methods like Suggestopedia uh, encourages errors. Isn't it? It's okay to make errors. It doesn't matter because all you want to do is you get the meaning. But with GTM, you need to be correct. You need to be accurate. And if you are wrong, teacher needs to correct the student. So error is not tolerated in this method. Right? <clears throat> and always very rigid. It will follow textbooks format. Uh, because of the accuracy, because we want students to learn grammar uh, the way it should be taught, then it should follow the textbook. I think this is what is happening in the school, in schools. Uh, before the PBS, the school-based assessment, the SBA. Uh, when I was in school, I was taught using grammar-based method. We had to learn the grammar rules. I think when it was your time, you were more on the CLT method, right? Communicative language teaching. The one Dr. Zarina lectured about, where you don't really focus on the grammar. When I was in school, it was what we had to learn. One day in one week, 40 minutes on grammar rules al alone. So there will be like uh, a lot of tables that we have to memorize. Ali goes to school. Ahmad goes to school. Ali and Ahmad go to school. Uh, very, very parrot-like. But there is a, a, a benefit of that. Until now, I can still remember the forms and function. So these are the things that there are pros and cons. Minimal interaction with the student because teacher is the controller in the class. So teacher will take over the whole lesson. Teacher will talk, teacher will give uh, notes, exercises and provide correct answers. And there is no, uh, not, uh, not much talking done by the students themselves. Students' roles, followers, <coughs> do what teachers say. You cannot um, be creative. You have to follow what your teacher tells you. Very passive. Because all you do is memorize, road learning, parroting. So nothing much done in the mental activity uh, per se everything has to be uh, to, to follow your teacher accordingly so it's very passive memorize vocabulary very limited uh, vocabulary because you memorize them so if you uh, to, uh, if you memorize 10 vocabulary per day then that's the only 10 that you will remember until the next lesson very rigid okay this was done in the 1960s and 70s to train soldiers. Okay, to train soldiers. To train soldiers to follow orders. This is the style they use. When you become soldiers, you cannot disobey. Isn't it? You have to obey. Saya yang menurut perintah. Okay? So, uh, soldiers need to be robotic. They cannot defy their superiors. They cannot go against their superior even if their superior did something wrong. They have to do it because that is how they are trained. Shoot and think later. That's what they are trained to do. Shoot and think later or shoot and don't think. Because if they think too much, they will not shoot or they will get shot. Okay, so this is a rigid military style method. You have to follow what the leader say. If the leader say you have to pee, uh, so while standing up, you have to do that. You cannot say no. So everybody has to follow the leader. And everyone has to memorize certain ways of talking or eating 
or socializing. Have you seen the story A uh, Few Good Men? A Few Good Men. Uh, it's way be before your time. It's by um, one of the actors was Tom Cruise. You know who Tom Cruise is? Okay. Yeah. And the Mimo. The actress was the Mimo. It's about a military soldier who was killed because he didn't want to follow order. And they were looking at the hierarchy. It, it seems that everyone in the camp was involved because you follow order. Okay? So this is actually a military-based method. It's very rigid. There's no room of creativity. There's no room of thinking too much. You only have to follow what the teacher says. So in a way, the teacher is the commander. The students are the soldiers, right? And you have to take dictations. Sorry? Yes, being take dictations from dictators. Dictations are the writing part. Remember, I, I explained it last uh, last lecture. You have to listen and you have to write down. Actually, there's no purpose for dictation. You can have other types of activities, but uh, it's one way of following the leader, follow rules, providing right answers. So students must provide right answer. They cannot be wrong. There's no grey area in this case. It has to be black or white. You can choose any color as long as it's black. Isn't it? You can choose any color you want as long as it's black. You have the freedom to choose any color as long as it's black. There's no freedom, isn't it? You can only choose black. So this is what uh, GTM is, providing right answers. Students cannot be wrong. You have to be right. Little interaction with other students. So most of the time, the work done in the class is individual work. Uh, no interaction whatsoever with your next door friend, next uh, uh, table friend. You, you don't have pair work. There will not be any pair work in this class. No group work whatsoever. Only individual work. It's very selfish, you know. This kind of method is very selfish. But it works if you are teaching students certain things. Okay? Strategies. Memorization. Memorize, memorize, memorize. That is the strategy. So, parrot-like, as I say. Parrots can memorize, but they don't know what they are memorizing about. They are very clever in imitating people, but do they know what it means? They don't. So these are like that. You memorize. Sometimes you memorize a whole essay, but do you know what you write about? No. You only memorize. Information questions. What was that? Fill in the blanks. These are, mo um, these are very rigid, uh, boring activities. Comprehension questions. Usually comprehension questions are right or wrong questions, isn't it? It has to be right because the comprehension, the answers come from the text that you are reading. Use words in sentences. Antonym, synonym. What is antonym? Opposite. Opposite meaning. What is synonym? Same. Similar meaning. Okay. Composition. Because of uh, the focus is more on reading and writing, so there will be a lot of composition in the class. So can you imagine a language class with no listening and speaking activities at all? This is like the olden days during your mom's days just ask them there's not much speaking done in the classroom it's always always writing and reading and writing and reading and writing and reading and a language class was very quiet at that times so during that times okay so because you're focusing on composition <clears throat> and translations of course because of the method nature you need to do a lot of translations It's very difficult if you want to translate 
something from Shakespeare. Can you imagine a class? Now I give you, okay, please translate Sonnet 35. Into Bahasa Malaysia. Not into plain English, into Bahasa Malaysia. You will have a very, very hard time. I think even when the semester ends, you will not be able to do that. Because the words used are even very, very difficult. Like the th uh, thy, thou, the, art, or, okay? That is what happens in the translation classroom. Translate into your own language, not translate into uh, normal English. Translate into your own language. Okay? Disadvantages. We look at the uh, disadvantages. Sometimes students get wrong idea of what the target language is. Because it's very rigid, you only learn certain chunks. You only learn certain things. So you get a wrong idea. You get a wrong impression. You will feel like uh, it's very limited. Uh, English is this way. As especially when you have to memorize. Okay? Students have lack of comprehension. Why are you down there? You can't see. Okay, not never mind, you can sit down there. I don't have any qualms. <laughs> Suggestopedia, there's no music. Okay, students have lack of comprehension because you memorize, you don't understand. When people ask you, uh, what was the passage about? Because the answer can be found in the passage. Without understanding the passage, you can get the answers. So you, you don't have comprehension, you don't have meaning. Motivation wise is very low Because uh, One, you have to listen to the teacher Two, you cannot make mistake So the students When they know they cannot make mistake They have to be right all the time When they come into class The anxiety level will be very high Or they don't come to class at all Isn't it? They, they are afraid to make errors The teacher doesn't tolerate errors So why bother to show up in class? Since you know you are going to make errors, just might as well go AWOL from the class, play truancy. So students' motivation are very, very low. Students do not learn to read. They learn to memorize. They learn to parrot, not, not learn to read. Okay? Create frustration for learners. There's no leeway. It has to be right or wrong. So learners become frustrated. After a few times of wrong answers, they will be very demotivated. They will not learn more and they just drop out from the class. Uh, but for soldiers, they have to. But sometimes we, we get people who drop out from the course because they cannot stand it. Okay, So it, it creates a, a frustrat frustration for learners and the atmosphere will be very, very gloomy, very, very dull. Very, very tense because you have to be right all the time. Extensive use of memorization. Might as well put parrots inside, right? Not students. Put parrots and teach them. Train them. Don't put students in. Rigid. So the, 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 uh, the summary of it all, this method is very rigid. Okay. Do you think it's still suitable to use that method in the classroom nowadays? No. Why not? Because information is uh, available everywhere. Okay. Uh, that is if you want to upgrade your knowledge. But skills, you still have to learn. You still have to come to class. Not come to class, but you still have to know how to learn skills. For example, how to write. I don't think you can get that from the internet. How to write certain things. How to read certain things. That can be found um, from a teacher or when you read books instead. Or manuals. Um, I think this would be suitable, in my opinion, it would be suitable for very, very beginners. Language learners who 
very very early in the in the stage where they don't know anything they come in you give them the grammar rules and then after that you let them uh, off very very beginning but not when uh, the student is in form 4 or form 5 for that matter because they've already got the basic in the primary school during the primary school yes you can use this type of memorization but in, in form in the secondary school it's not advisable to use it because students will uh, be very frustrated all right okay there is some advantages sorry there are some advantages of gtm actually um, one of the advantages is if you want to teach them grammar rules and sentence structure this is the most effective way of doing it so early in the years schooling years you use gtm um, teach them the rules the grammar rules teach them the sentence structure uh, you know the subject verb object subject verb predicate complement all those things should be taught early in the school years meaning when they are in primary school they should be taught that so that when they go to secondary school they will be able to write proper sentences okay does not need teacher with near native speaking ability remember if you want remember during the um, silent way or direct method the teacher must be very very fluent in english near native speaking ability isn't it in this uh, <coughs> method teachers don't have to be very fluent you can not be like native speakers you can be uh, just about how you are because you only need a lot of writing and reading skills you don't yes they need to know the grammar to write but not to speak sometimes uh, okay in terms of uh, Malaysian not not Malaysian but in terms of second language learners we are better in writing second language learners are better in writing or EFL are better like our voice uh, her, her, in her case is EFL isn't it EFL and ESL are better in writing compared to native speakers this is a fact I have seen um, samples of them. In terms of speaking, of course, they are better because they are native speakers. They are born with that language. But in terms of writing, um, the ESL and EFL learners are way better. Because you are, we are trained to write, and, uh, to write and spell the correct way, the right way. Whereas the native speakers, they will spell the way they listen or talk. If it's uh, butter, as in butter, then there will be one T. B U T E R. Butter. Okay? Uh, and um, they will spell it the way uh, they, they say it. And like the Americans will drop all the U's. Color. What else? Detour flavor all the u will be dropped and then all the re becomes er right uh, so those are the things that when they write it's not the way we write so esl and efl learners are better in terms of writing and uh, reading okay <coughs> less demands on teachers because teachers don't have to be creative teachers just follow textbooks so less demands on teachers. They don't have to come up with uh, fancy uh, programs on the internet or they don't have to come up with um, uh, a lot of uh, real life materials to bring to class. They can just follow the textbook. Only utilizes textbooks. This is like the olden days. When I was in school, this is the, the method they use. Textbooks. But at that time, the textbooks were very colorful compared to now. Now, I think textbooks are very dull, isn't it? It's black and white, very dull. But uh, during my time, the textbooks were very colorful. Sorry? Yes, the older you get, the duller the textbook is. So it's very, you know, it, it doesn't really catch the attention. I remember when I was teaching <coughs> the, old, uh, the, the last classes, I told them to keep their textbooks at home. 
one they cannot be able to follow two it's just going to make their bags heavier because english textbooks are like stones <coughs> tablets you know so thick so i said you know keep your books at home we'll we'll do handouts uh, and 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 um you know uh, papers or, or posters rather than textbooks and it's very dull i agree with you it's very dull less rigorous lesson preparation because uh, of the uh, nature of the method that that's why you don't have to prepare so much bring your textbook that's all you don't have to bring a lot of materials into classroom you don't have to spend nights and nights of endless sleepless nights to uh, prepare your lesson plan you just bring your textbook into class ask the students to uh, copy or uh, do exercises in the textbook and least stressful for student i think uh, there is a little bit of stress it's just that uh, they don't have to bring a lot of books uh, they only follow what the teacher say but the motivation will be very low because they cannot make errors okay they cannot make errors okay any questions on gtm any ideas that you want to share with the grammar translation method what do you think of the method can it still be used you have said just now you you mentioned can it be used with other methods do you think can can it be be integrated with the other methods that you have used you have learned no not with suggestopedia but with direct or silent way can can it be merged together can what do you think direct way doesn't allow sorry direct method doesn't allow translation you can't merge them together isn't it one does and the other one doesn't uh silent way may be up to a, an extent but direct method you can't because direct method doesn't allow you to even think in your own language you have to think in the target language okay let's watch a video on a total physical response actually i've uploaded the video online on moodle so have a look and get some ideas on what total physical response mean i can't find any videos on gtm or la but i have found one video which i feel summarizes what tpr is all about Just repeating. repeating. Anything else? Memorizing. 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 A lot of body language. A lot of gestures. Hence the name physical response. Okay. But the teacher was very enthusiastic and energetic. Okay. Even though he's quite, you know, old veteran, you have to be like that. Okay, you have to be like that, and the children are also responding to him very well because he's very energetic, and the children are also looking. Oh, the teacher is very energetic, so they have to be energetic as well. So if you are very uh, slow in the classroom, you come dragging your feet, then the students are going to feel that as well. Okay, so you have to be energetic. Okay, what is TPR? Babies don't learn by memorizing lists. Is it true? Yeah. Isn't it? What did babies do when they were little? When you were little, you can of course you can remember. Uh, but usually babies learn by doing, imitating what the parents do. So babies don't learn by memorizing lists. Why should adults and students and children 
When you were young, you wanted to learn language. You listen to your parents. You listen to people around you talk. You don't memorize. Of course, there is some memorization involved, but some of the time, you, when you think that it's wrong, then the baby will uh, re-evaluate itself and then do it the right way. So they don't learn by memorizing lists. Why should we ask our children and our students to memorize? This is actually an, the end of the other paradigm. You have the GTM, you have TPR. Okay? And this quote is actually made by the advocator of TPR, James Asher. Okay? James Asher. <coughs> he is uh, an emeritus professor of psychology. He's a professor of psychology at San Jose State University in California. So he was the one who came up with this whole t total physical response. Total physical response are usually integrated with direct method. Still remember direct method? No translation allowed? Yeah, okay, so usually it's integrated with TPR. It's also sometimes integrated with silent way. And both, it can be both. Total physical with total physical, meaning that the whole lesson will be carried out all in total physical response. Or sometimes it can be integrated with half direct method, half TPR. Half silent way, half TPR. Used widely by international students. This is one of the characteristics that is very unique to TPR, whereby uh, a lot of international students uses this uh, method because they feel that it can help them to learn language better. Used in higher learning institutions. Usually in Asian countries, uh, TPR is used in higher learning institutions. But if you look at the video, if you remember the video, it's used with the preschoolers. Isn't it? With preschoolers. So, uh, the Westerners, they use TPR with preschoolers. Uh, the Eastern countries usually use TPR with the higher learning institution. Background. It's developed by James Asher, as I mentioned just now. James J. Asher, a professor of psychology. It originated in the 60s. It's still a long time ago. But it became popular in the 70s and the 80s. And it's still being practiced now. So, um, it's not saying that it's not being practiced anymore. It's still being practiced now. And the video that I showed just now is a scenario of a new TPR being practiced in the 21st century. It is because James Asher found that there is a very high level rate of dropout cases in second language classes in higher education. So maybe when uh, in the first early, uh, early semester there will be 100 of them enrolling in the class. Towards the end of the semester, only 30 or 20 left. So there's a very high rate of dropouts. Uh, and he, when he uh, researched, he found out that students are just not learning language. Students are just not uh, doing it right. So they will, be, uh, they, they will uh, leave the classes. They feel that they're not making any progress, so they will leave the classes. Teaching are based on the coordination of speech and action. If you watch the video just now, the teacher says something and there is an action accompanying the speech. So teaching is based on coordination of speech and action. It's always linked to trace memory. This is what James Asher came up with. Because he's a psychologist, he studies the brain and the mental activities. He feels that there is a trace theory whereby the more in intensive the memory connection is traced the stronger the memory association will be 
Meaning that if you remember or if you can relate things, you can remember more. That's what he's saying, trace memory. If you can relate things, you can remember more. Remember when you were in school, you used the mnemonic device to uh, memorize your jadual berkala in your sign in science periodic table. Ah, uh, in science, isn't it? You have to use mnemonic devices. I don't know how many mnemonic devices. Uh, you have to remember the the um, position of the um, of the logam of the minerals. You have to remember the position. What comes first? Can you remember? Hydrogen. Huh? Hydrogen is gas. Minerals. It's K. It's calcium. Calcium. Uh, I remember when I was in school, my teacher taught me a mnemonic device. It's Kamal, as in calcium, Na, natrium, Kena, calcium, Mara, magnesium, uh, Kamal, Na, Kena, Mara, Abu, Orem, Zinc, Kupram, Timah, Perak, Raksa, uh, Rosakkan, Pen, Emas, Platinum. The last one is Platinum. But I remember her mnemonic device. I'm sorry, Eva, but you, you, you can't understand. Okay, but it's in bahasa. Kamal nak kena marah Abu Zain bentuk pahang kerana rosakkan pen, emas, platinum. And that was 22 years ago. I can still remember. Form 5. Periodic table. Kamal nak kena marah Abu Zain bentuk pahang kerana rosakkan pen, emas, platinum. The last part is the platinum. Emas is orum. A-U-R-U-M. Kamal is kalium. The first, the, the, the highest is kalium. Kalium, natrium, uh, calcium, magnesium, uh, kena mara, abu, aluminium, zinc, uh, abu zin, kerana, kupram, rosakkan is mercury, raksa, uh, pen, uh, I can't remember, um, uh, pen, uh, plumbum, emas, platinum. I can still remember the mnemonic device. I don't know how yours are. You don't have to memorize it because they give you in the exam. Yes. At, at my time, there wasn't any periodic table. We have to memorize. And the boys, I was in a, a, a boarding school. The boys has an X-rated version of it, uh, which they don't tell the girls. But that is mnemonic device, where you uh, remember things, you associate things, this is my trace memory. I can still remember it even though that's, uh, it has been 22 years since I took my SBM. So now you can count my, my age. Okay? Minus 22. Okay? Allow students to act spontaneously. So with TPR, students are encouraged to uh, react spontaneously. You don't have to think too much. Whatever you feel, you react. And it uh, is focusing a lot on physical activities. Hence, the actions that you see from the video. There's a lot of actions. Uh, say hello to your mom. Isn't it? And then, mom says, eat. Uh, and then, uh, mom shows you a plant. So, every, every single word was being enunciated by action. So, the students can remember more. Isn't it? They can remember more. Asher draws on three influential hypotheses. This is how he got the total physical response theory. Sorry, method. The first is there is a specific innate bio program. Bio program means uh, something that happens in our mind for language learning. So every one of us, there is an innate bio program that defines an optimal path for first and second language development, meaning that everybody is capable of learning a second or a third or a fourth language. 
in ourselves there is an innate bio program that we cannot actually see but it's there okay brain lateralization defines different learning functions in the left and right brain hemisphere so if you learn biology you will know that the right brain has the left brain has got different functions from the uh, the right brain and stress always always talking about stress whatever it is stress will become the hinder hindrance that will act between what is learning and what is to be learned so when you have stress you cannot learn that's a short uh, short form of it stress comes in between what you want to learn and what you have already know okay so these are the three influential learning hypotheses that Asher came up with and from that hypothesis he came up with the total physical response method Bio program. Bio program means children understand complex utterances. They cannot spontaneously produce. If you look at your small brothers or sisters, if you ask them to go and eat, they will go. They understand what you are saying. It's just that they cannot produce the same thing that you have thought, uh, you have mentioned. They cannot say uh, go and eat. If they want, they will say eat. Eat. Milk. Even though they want to say, I want milk, but they can just say milk. They cannot produce utterance, but they can understand. It's innate, means it's inside us. And most of the time, the bio program focuses on listening rather than speaking. Listening first. So if you look at small children, they will listen first. And some of them will not speak until they are like three or four years old. They listen, they listen, they will do things you ask them to do, but they don't speak. Some, stu uh, some children, they are late speaker, but they are very good listeners. Okay? Children are very good listeners. <coughs> brain lateralization, right brain hemisphere, controls the motor movement, all your movements, uh, your hand movement, your eye blinking, you know, all your motor movement. Whereas your left brain will control the watch and learn part. The learning activity is on your left brain. Okay? So that's why when uh, sometimes when there is, there is an accident, um, your brain gets injured, sometimes you, you can see that some people, they have to learn from scratch. They're like babies again. They have to learn how to talk. They have to learn how to walk again. They have to learn how to uh, eat. They have to learn how to use their hands. So that is when their left, uh, sorry, right brain has been damaged. Okay, so they become like children and they have to learn again the ways to do things even though they are adults. Sometimes you, uh, people with stroke, who got stroke, <clears throat> sometimes they have to re-coordinate uh, their movement. Uh, these are the right side brain. That's, that means the right side brain is already uh, being tampered with. Okay, if you don't remember things, then it's your left side brain. Uh, sometimes you remember a lot of things. Sometimes you remember selectively. Good things, you want to remember more. Bad things, you don't want to remember. And when you are older, when you get older, you will remember things like seven years back or eight years back, but you cannot remember things which happened just now. Meaning your short-term memory is very weak, but your long-term memory is very strong. That's when you get older. And that is the left side brain. Reduction of stress. The lower the stress, the better it actually applies to any method. As long as there is stress-free, you will learn better. Okay. Uh, teach oral proficiency at beginning level. This is the objective. So, Early days, you need to teach the students how to speak, oral proficiency. Produce learners who are capable of an uninhibited communication. So, if you look at the words uninhibited, meaning that you don't, there's no rigidity. You can make errors. Uninhibited. You can say what you want. You can uh, express your own self without feeling fear of making mistakes. Okay? Goals are attainable through action-based drills. 
So there's a lot of drills. If you look at the, if you remember the video just now, the teacher repeats the gestures, the set, the sentences over and over again, isn't it? That's drills in imperative form. Say hello to your mom. Short sentences. Show your mom the plant. Your mom says eek. So it's very short sentences. We call them imperative forms. Short sentences. Facilita facilitating a suitable comprehension and speaking period. So there must be a, a time where students are given opportunity to speak as they like. Okay, these are the objectives of TPR. Rules are taught in context. Remember just now, in GTM, rules are deductively taught. Meaning the rules are taught as it is. However, in TPR, the rules are taught inductively. Meaning the rules are inside the context. Attention to meaning, then forms to item. Form of items. So, this is similar to CLT, communicative uh, task, uh, communicative task learning, whereby you communicative learning task CLT, whereby you are more uh, focusing on the meaning rather than the forms. Fixed numbers of items should be introduced, thirty or less. Remember just now the teacher. Can you remember how many sentences he uses in that? Particular short video? Six. There's only six sentences. So you have to be uh, fixed. You cannot teach more than 30 items, 30 or less. But in that case, only six sentences. Sentence based grammatical syllabus. However, that the last part doesn't work well with our classroom because it works best from six to eight students. Uh, so, given the number of the students in our classroom, 25 to 30, uh, this may not be as suitable to be used in the classroom. Okay, so you have 30 students in the classroom making actions is quite difficult to control. If you are teaching preschool, where your kids are, there's only 10 of them in one class, then TPR works best. Okay, six to eight students. TPR activities, role play. Remember just now? There's a lot of role play, isn't it? Action. Imperative dialogues. Show mum the plan. Say, uh, say hello to mum. Very short and uh, sweet, short and sweet dialogues. Storytelling. It's now the teacher asks the students to number the sentences when listening to the CD. So it's like storytelling. Learning objects. And games. So these are the activities that can be used in a TPR classroom. Because uh, you need a lot of physical actions. Okay. Role of teachers. Active and direct role. So teachers are active. Teachers provide opportunity for learning even though the classroom is, uh, we, we don't say it as uh, teacher control but the teacher need to provide the chance for the students to learn and uh, speak. Select materials and models language. So the teacher was a model just now. If you look at the, the, the video, the teacher will say it first. Say hello to your mom. Uh, give your mom the plan. So the teacher will model first the language. Provide parent-like feedback. So you have to be like parent. Good. Excellent. You have done very well. Okay. But it works with small kids. If you do it with secondary kids, they'll feel very annoyed. Yeah. You're like, it's like condescending, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so you can do that with uh, secondary school kids. They say the teacher is crazy. And refrain from making too much correction. So, error is tolerated. It doesn't matter as long as you get the meaning, as long as you get whatever language is okay. Role of teacher as decider, director, organizer, sensitive instructor, detailed lesson plan creator. 
So uh, the teacher needs to be a little bit more creative and uh, there's a bit more work to be done with, uh, with uh, TPR rather than GTM. GTM, you only use the textbooks. Like TPR, you have to bring um, worksheets to school, you have to bring CD, you have to um, you know, do things, you have to maybe bring videos. So it's a little bit more uh, work than uh, using GTM. Okay, role of learners, listener and performer, need to listen attentively. This is the key uh, feature in TPR. The students need to listen. If not, they are not able to emulate the teacher. So the, the students need to listen first and then emulate the teacher. Respond physically. Recognize and respond to novel combination of previously taught items. So they learn, they try to relate what they have learned with the previously taught uh, knowledge. Speak only when they feel ready. So there is no pressure. If you don't want to speak, you can be quiet. When you are ready, you speak. So there's no pressure in the classroom. And sometimes you will get the same people talking, the same student talking. It's okay because he's already have got the confidence. The others may take some other time or some time to be confident. So it's okay, just leave, in, uh, leave them be. Speak only when the students are ready. Okay. Uh, produce novel items on their own. And uh, students should also be able to monitor and evaluate their own progress. Meaning they, have, they know uh, where they are, how they want to learn, and how to go about in their learning. And uh, students are always encouraged to speak in class. Okay, always encouraged to speak in class. Advantages, it's fun, easy and enjoyable. Promote long-term retention because when you do things, you know, uh, people say if you listen, you only get 10% of what you listen. If you read, you only get 20%. But if you do, you get 90% of what you uh, learn. So when you do things, you will be, you remember more. Long-term retention will be promoted. It's a suitable tool for language development. Teachers have to uh, do short preparation. There's no long preparation involved. There's a very stress-free environment because students are not forced to speak. And uh, it seems that it's an effective environment and method for young adults as well as learners. Uh, young learners and adults. Meaning secondary school and adult learners. So maybe you can try this with your class. If you have less than... 10 students, which will be unlikely, okay? Unless you're teaching preschool, then it's okay. Uh, the disadvantages also are only suitable for beginners. So if you have an advanced classroom, you cannot use this one. They will be very bored. Challenge for shy students because you are expected to speak, even though uh, you can speak when you are ready, but you're still expected to speak. So it might be a bit stressful for the shy ones. No opportunity to be creative because you follow what the teacher say. Can be repetitive and monotonous. So, uh, just now if you look at the uh, slide, sorry, video, there's only six sentences being repeated. And if that's 30 minutes being repeated, only six sentences, then you know it's going to be very monotonous. And for abstract language, it's very difficult to teach. It's, it's okay to teach concrete language. But abstract language like poetry, it's very difficult to teach poetry using total physical response. Okay? Uh, how do you teach uh, flowery languages with your hands, with your physical movement? It's very difficult to do that. So these are the disadvantages of uh, TPR. And also the advantages of TPR to be used in classroom. Okay. Lexical approach. Do you need a five minutes break? Yeah, yeah okay. We'll have a five minutes break. And then uh, we'll go on with lexical approach. 
which deals with physical activities. We have also covered a uh, grammar translation method, which focuses on grammar and translation. Now we look at the lexical approach. When you look at the title, what comes to mind? Lexical approach. What kind of method will it be? What does the word lexical associate with? Dictionary, okay, one way. Any other things? When the word lexical comes into mind, what are, what are the other things that you think about? Meaning, okay. Vocabulary, yes. Anything else? Lexis, okay. Lexical, Lexis, not Lexus, not the car. Lexis, okay. Lexicon. So those are things connected with vocabulary. Okay, vocabulary and words, words formation. Okay. Lexical approach are language consists not of traditional grammar and vocabulary, but often of multi-word. Fabri prefabricated chunks. So uh, Michael Lewis said that language is not just grammar and vocab, but they are also consisting of words in chunks, like phrases, for example. Okay, like uh, you don't have a sentence uh, st structure, but you have phrases, you have syntax. So those are things which are also included in language. So not just grammar and vocabulary. Okay, background of uh, the L, uh, LA. Building blocks of language learning and communication are not just grammar, function and notion. So not just that. It's more than that. It's more than grammar. It's more than functions. It's more than forms. It consists of lexis, words and words combination. So these are actually things that should be included in language as well. Now, if you remember, GTM originated in the 1960s. Uh, sorry, GTM originated in the 1500s, isn't it? Uh, TPR originated in the 1960s. LA originated in the 90s. Okay, in the 90s. So, within that period, there wasn't anyone who said that actually language is not just grammar and vocab. After 1990s, James, sorry, not James Escher, Michael Lewis came out and said that actually it's more than just that. It's also a combination of words and words combi combined together. Okay? And the key figures in this uh, method are lexical syllabus by Willis, 1990, as well as lexical approach by Lewis in 1993. So in the 1990s, they came up with this new method called the lexical approach. And uh, the one who advocated it was Lewis, 1993, Michael Lewis. Okay. Main features, uh, Lexis is the central role for language learning. So, uh, vocabulary, words, words uh, formation, lexicals are the central role, central figure in language learning. You have to know the lexical approach, you have to know the words before you can go into the grammar rules. Chunks are lexical prefabricated items. Chunks represent a significant portion of a native speaker's spoken and written output. So you learn in chunks. You don't learn a whole bulk. You learn language in chunks so that you can digest and ingest it easier. That's what Louis is saying. Lexis is not just concentrating on vocabulary. It consists of single word and word combination. 
So if you need to read more on lexical approach, you can read the book that I suggested, Rogers and Richards, or you can read Michael Lewis's book on lexical approach. Okay, because this is quite new. Eh? Lexical approach is quite new. Multi word or multi word items or chunks. What it means? One is normal words like computer, pen, book, chair, fan. Typical single word uh, vocabulary. And then you have poly words. In addition, high and low. It doesn't show object. Poly words means words that you use to make your sentence jazzier. Okay, nicer. So poly words, in addition, high and low. And then you have collocation, community service. Okay, uh, collocation means words that you um, gel together. Two words, different words that you gel together to make a different word. Okay, community is one word, service is one word. You gel them together, it becomes another word, a new word. Okay? Bread is one word. Butter is one word. You gel them together, you get bread and butter pudding. Something like that. Peanut, butter and jelly. Sandwich. Okay? That is collocation. Fish and chips. Fish is one thing. Chips is one thing. You gel them together, you get one thing. Isn't it? Fish and chip. Okay? <coughs> Fixed expressions. Let me see to it. If it is me, so these are fixed expression. If you take them, if you take one word out, it doesn't mean anything. This is fixed expressions. And sentence frames or head. The problem is, I understand but, meaning that there will be a, a few sentences in one syntax. Okay? So these are multi word items or chunks words, polywords, collocation, fixed expressions, and Sentence frames or heads. Okay. Objective of the LA speech rather than writing. So it's not on writing or reading, it's more on uh, the fluency of the speech. To produce students with social -long linguistics competence. So you are able to communicate, converse competently. That's what uh, LA is all about. It's not for students to write fluently or read fluently. No, it's to for students to uh, to produce students who are competent in speaking and listening skills. Grammatical error is recognized, so it's okay to make errors because it's an intrinsic thing to the learning process. Grammar, uh, sorry, error is inevitable. Error is part of learning process. So. In LA, it's okay. You can make errors because it's part of, part and parcel of uh, the learning process. And tasks and process are emphasized. So not the product. It's process, uh, the, the focus is on tasks, the doing, and the process that you go through when you are doing certain things. It's not the product. They are not too concerned on the product. And receptive skill is enhanced. Receptive is like listening and speaking. Okay? Teacher's roles, main source of input, just like the other methods, teacher plays a central role in lexical approach as well. Teacher will impart with the knowledge and teacher will be the model of the language. Teacher will provide scaffolding to learners. So instead of uh, GTM where teacher tell the learner what to say, what to do, teacher just provide the skeleton. And the learner will fill the skeleton with their own uh, knowledge and their own skills. So teacher just provide the scaffold, the scaffold, the, the, the main frame of the learning process. The one who's filling the learning the, the frame will be the students. Teacher will help and facilitate learners to manage their own learning. So this has a little bit feeling of anonymous, uh, sorry, autonomous learning. A little bit, not too much, but there is some opportunity where learners manage their own learning. A little bit of autonomous learner being practiced in this approach. 
okay and then students roles are to analyze real life language based on own experience so when they use the language they will relate it to their own uh, surroundings and in that way they will learn more so that is what LA is all about to give students the opportunity to learn in their own environment observe classify and generalize and students are explorers and discoverer it's just like Dora the explorer isn't it students are like Dora the explorer where can a sniper be? Sniper? Swiper? Swiper be? Swiper? <laughs> where, where is Swiper? I remember it when my daughter used to watch it. Uh, where is Swiper? Uh, go away Swiper, isn't it? So, children, uh, sorry, student will explore. Explore the learning process. Discover the learning process. Okay, activities in LA. Listen and read intensively and extensively. So when you were, uh, some of you did some micro teaching on extensive and intensive reading, actually you also incorporated the LA approach, LA lexical approach, uh, because lexical approach is used in listening and reading intensively and extensively. There's a lot of repetition and recycling of activities in LA. Guessing meaning of words from context. So these are the things that we do in class. It's just that we don't know it's called lexical approach. Okay, like when we are guessing uh, words, like what your friend did just now with adjectives, with, uh, with adverbs, that is actually a lexical approach. Right? Identifying word patterns and collocations. And using dictionaries. So and, uh, a lexical approach method Use a lot of dictionaries, a lot of thesaurus, okay? Other reference tools, a lot of thesaurus, a lot of dictionary, a lot of spell checkers to make sure that the words used are the correct ones. Okay, I did not see the advantages because there's no advantages at the moment. It's still, still new and not being practiced too widely. But uh, it seems that if one of the advantages is that students' uh, vocabulary will be widened. And it depends on what kind of approach you take. Sometimes it can be stressful because all you learn is words. Sometimes it can be a bit too boring because you are only looking at words and word formation. So the disadvantages of this approach is learner overload. There's too many words learned in one period. 40 minutes, there's too many words being taught. So maybe causing learner overload. The lack of available pedagogical material. So there is no um, such thing as a lexical approach material out there. There's no one um, definite resource that talks about lexical approach in the market at this time. Not yet. Textbook fail to recycle Lexis systematically. So look at textbook. Sometimes unit one and unit two are talking about different things. So there's no recycling going on. Non-native teachers sometimes uses different words, different terms. Okay. And existing published material are not corpus based. Corpus means words, word based. It does. It doesn't really look at words. It's sometimes most of the time it's skill based. It's not corpus based. If you look at our textbook in the syllabus, everything is being organized according to skills, not according to corpus. Okay? So these are the disadvantages of the lexical approach. That's the end of the lecture. <laughs>